Hello everyone, welcome to our October CCFG webinar. Uh, I'm pleased to say that we have Barry Gardner with us this evening. Um, Barry's kindly agreed to do a webinar for us on forest resistance and irregular forest stands. Um, Barry has been, uh, it had been in forest research for 22 years and um, Bill Mason, our chairman of CCFG was um, Barry's boss for a lot of that time. Uh, his main work was um, in wind risk and timber properties, and I'm sure that we're going to have a very interesting presentation from Barry. So, Barry, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm feeling a bit humbled by the number of people that have turned up to this to this seminar, and I hope uh, I provoke some interest and uh, maybe help to answer some questions. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen and um, let me know that, is that okay? Is that working okay? Yeah, we can see it, thank you. Okay, so um, I'm slightly, I've slightly changed what I'm talking about um, this evening or this afternoon. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more generally about forest resistance and, and the benefits of irregular forests that might, might be uneven aged or un, uh, uh, multi-species stands. And um, I want to put it in the context of the developing demand on forests in Europe and the, um, the developing or the increasing threats to our forests because of different hazards and the role of the changing climate. So I hope, I'm trying to be a little, not controversial, but I want to raise a number of issues that I think are really important, maybe get some debate going uh, at the end of the talk. So um, I'm actually talking to you from Castillon le Bataille in, uh, in the Gironde of France where uh, England managed to lose Aquitaine, which was rather unfortunate in the Battle of Castillon in 1453. Anyway, uh, I work at the Institute European de la Foricole today and at Albert Ludwig University in Germany. I'm also an honorary fellow of forest research. Um, let me see if I can get... So the outline of my presentation is first a little review of demands on European forests. A potential response to these demands, potential forest types, threats to forests, and how continuous cover forestry and wind damage risk, how, what's the wind damage risk uh, in continuous cover forestry and whether that's better than more even aged forests. And then I'll summarize. So just um, a graph showing how world industrial roundwood production has been increasing steadily. You can see some, um, can you see my mouse when I move here? Can you see my mouse? So there's a dip here at the economic crisis and then there's been a dip with, um, with the uh, COVID uh, outbreak, although production has now gone back up again. And, um, the same is also true of fuel wood production, which has been going up. And this is world, worldwide, but it's the same in Europe. And at the same time as producing all these um, wood, uh, timber outputs, forests are expected to produce a range of ecosystem services. Um, and they include things like recreation, biodiversity, uh, clean water, and so on. And um, also sequestering carbon. And many of these, most of these are not, not paid for in any way. Um, so uh, forests have to produce more and more outputs and um, the amount of land available is generally uh, pretty much the same. Uh, it's difficult to find new land to, to plant on. So big challenges for forestry. At the same time, the damage trends in European forests, unfortunately, are increasing 
Uh, there's some big spikes here from big windstorms in 1990 and in 1999 and other storms. But what you'll notice here uh, on the right is um, an increase in bark beetle outbreaks. And this doesn't even cover uh, the last, this last couple of years. And it's really gone off, off the scale, uh, bark beetle outbreaks um, in Central Europe. And if you break it down by different um, hazards, you can see all of them are increasing. Bark beetles is going up like crazy, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Wind has traditionally been the, the biggest cause of damage in Europe at, overall. But of course, things like fire tend to be um, a problem in the more southerly countries, and particularly in the Mediterranean. This is from a paper that's about to be published. Um, just to, to uh, frighten everybody, this is the Harz Mountains in the north central part of Germany, which I visited a number of years ago. This is the picture in 2018, and this is the same picture in 2019. All this Norway spruce has, has been killed by bark beetles. Uh, overall, in Germany in the last three years, more than 200 million cubic meters of Norway spruce have been, have been killed. That's more than the total annual production of European forests, excluding Russia. So it's an enormous uh, disaster in Central Europe. Norway spruce is the main timber species in, in Germany and Czech Republic. And... and um, and it's, it's all dead, it's all dying, or a lot of it, a large percentage of it is dying. And this is the result of three years of drought and dry conditions, and the trees have been under stress and then um, been very susceptible to bark beetle attack. But we've also been having fires. This is from 2017 in Portugal, a devastating uh, summer of, of fires and um, more than 60 people died in these fires. Um, particularly these fires occurring in eucalyptus, eucalyptus plantations. But even in Sweden, this is 2018. In Sweden, there were forest fires um, unheard of in Sweden, in, um, in the region where they got the fires. So things changing um, in Europe as a whole. Hazards. Um, are happening in places where they've not been seen before. This is an aerial photograph. I don't know how well any of you know the area um, of Aquitaine, but this is just south of um, the Arcajon Basin, so that's up here. This is Dune de Pilar, which is the highest sand dune in Europe. It's a big tourist attraction, and all this is burnt uh, this summer. And we had very high temperatures, very dry conditions for a long period, and easterly winds. So the wind was blowing off the land onto the sea. There was very little moisture. Um, this area is, is semi-natural mar maritime pine forest, uh, all burnt because somebody's van broke down and he pulled off into the forest and it caught fire and set fire to the forest. This is a big naval, a big air force base. All the planes had to be flown out to safety. 30,000 hectares were lost this uh, summer in Aquitaine. We've had nothing like it since the Second World War. And wind. Um, this is, some of you might know, this is Clokinog Forest in, in North Wales. That is me when I used to work at Forest Research. Um, this story is slightly funny because um, if any of you know Arne Pomeranin, he marked all the trees that were to be left as the frame trees, but the contractors thought the markings were for the trees that to be cut down. <laughs> so they cut down his frame trees, and unfortunately the whole stand started to collapse after that. Um, this is 2000 and... Um, Nine in Aquitaine here, uh, storm clouds, which did a huge amount of damage. Um, this is all maritime pine blown down by that storm, an enormous amount of damage. It's 
the reason that I came here was because I was asked to come and work on that, that problem in this part of France. Um, this is the Lothar in the Black Forest of Germany. Um, pathogens, here we have um, Phytophthora in March. Um, and this is um, pine nematode in uh, pine in Portugal. These are, these are ex, an expanding risk to pine forests in this part of the world. And there's the changing climate and concerns about changing wind patterns. So there's some suggestion that in the period from August to October, we might get higher um, wind speeds in, in the Gulf of Biscay, the Gulf de Gascoigne, and in the North Sea. And uh, this article came out very recently in The Guardian and suggesting that the US Atlantic coast now a breeding ground for supercharged hurricanes. Um, I'm just trying to think what the hurricane was that recently hit Florida, I've forgotten the name, um, but more intense hurricanes all along the Atlantic coast of the United States and Canada. And the problem is that those storms can often then cross the Atlantic and, um, and affect us in um, Northwest Europe. And the problem is if it's August to October, then a lot of trees will be in leaf that would would normally be out of leaf in the main windy part of the year. This is a picture from Poland of Scots pine badly damaged a few years ago from a squall line in the summer. So uh, an intense um, squall line of thunderstorms all lined up, caused huge amount of damage in Poland. They've not seen anything like that before. And the same thing um, happens has happened in Belarus and, and other parts of Eastern Europe. So wind damage that traditionally we've thought of as a problem in the winter now appearing to be becoming a summer problem in certain parts of um, Eastern Europe. This is 2018, October 2018, the Dolomites in Italy, Storm Bayer that did a huge amount of damage to Norway spruce forests in that part of Italy. These are protection for us primarily um, there to, to stop avalanche and rockfall onto roads and communities. And um, we thought Scotland had been getting it easy, so things seemed to be easier here, but then um, Storm Arwen came last November and did quite a lot of damage in Eastern Scotland and down into Eastern England. Um, this is near um, Dunbar in, uh, I think that's North, might be North Berwick Law um, over there. And um, so the winds coming from the right off the North Sea has, has damaged this pine plantation. You'll notice that the edge trees, as is normal, have survived. They, they're better adapted to, acclimated to the wind. But anyway, wind damage has returned um, to, to Scotland and England after a period of quiet. And one of the things that is always an issue is that um, damage from one agent, in this case wind, can lead to um, increased uh, levels of risk from other hazards. I like this picture, it's, it's from a PhD student of mine. It's from the Dolomites. Here in this region here, I'm marking, was wind damage and that's all blown down. Here you can see bark beetle outbreaks. I hope you can see these brown areas. Bark beetle outbreaks had started. Apparently they've, they've extended over the whole area now. In addition, this village and this road is now at higher risk of rock fall from this cliff face and avalanches. So um, it's not just um, the problem from one source of damage, it's the fact that there can be coupled hazards uh, that, that can be really a, a great concern. Um, just, just to point out the fact that we can never manage our forests only worrying about one um, hazard, we have to think of, of, of multiple hazards. So what do we do for the future? And there are different approaches when we're 
resources are becoming scarce. And I, um, I'm quoting here from a paper by Pretty in 1997. So the first one is we're optimistic. Business as usual, the market will provide by increasing productive area and slowing down of demand as the world population begins to stabilize. Uh, environmental pessimism, we've, lived, we've reached the limits of growth and we will be unable to sustainably supply the increasing demand. Um, the developing world cannot manage and the modernized world will provide what is needed and help protect the nat natural environment in the developing world. That's kind of a very Western centric view. I'll come back to each of these in a moment. And then there's new modernism. There'll be an intensification of the use of existing land with much more focus on a science-based approach. Okay, And it'll be sustainable because it'll be focused on a smaller area. And then there's this what's called sustainable intensification will integrate a range of methods and technologies to manage pests nutrients soil and water and increasing emphasis on using natural processes to start substitute for external inputs e.g fertilizer okay i think we can dismiss the business as usual optimism i mean that world does not exist anymore we've moved on and we have to face up to the fact that the world we live in has changed the climate has changed and, um, and we cannot continue to manage our forests and landscapes the way we have done in the past. Environmental pessimism, I think we have to move on for that. We, we cannot allow ourselves to be pessimistic and we do need to meet these increasing demands. And the industrialized world to, world to the rescue, I just don't believe it. It's um, it's actually the developing world that's going to be providing a lot of the, um, the wood supply of the future. So really we're down to inten more intense, intensive use of existing land or a more integrated approach sort of where we, we use more sustainable approaches and we um, we use more natural process to substitute for what would have been inputs um, in, the, in the past. When we talk about plantation forestry, this is the kind of thing we often think of. This is where I live, um, huge area, 1.2 million hectares, sorry, it's doing itself automatically, of um, maritime pine or here radiata pine, um, or eucalyptus uh, plantations. These are monocultures, even aged, intensive management, and highly mechanized um, production. And what are the but what are the alternatives that we have available? So one is we just have unmanaged forests to allow development of natural processes without human intervention. There's almost nowhere in Europe that's like that, but one area is, um, I'm not even going to pronounce this, but the forest in eastern Poland, which is about as close to natural forest as we have in our part of Europe. Uh, close to nature type forestry, where we produce timber by mimicking or emulating natural processes. This is a, an approach that's very popular in Central Europe. So I try to show a picture of what that might look like. Um, extensive management with combined objectives, combined production ecological objectives at the stand level. So that might be your, a mixed forest, mixed species forest, mixed aged forest. Um, I think this is from Fascoli, this picture in the uh, Tunnel Valley. Um, but in Northern Europe, in Sweden, it might look like this. They're, they're much more limited species choice there, um, but, but an uneven, it might, what we would call um, um, a stand replacement type system with an understory. And then as the uh, overstory gets mature, they'll be cut out and the, the uh, younger trees will take over from below. Um, intensive even age plantations. This has kind of been the default in, in the United Kingdom and, and in this part of the world where I'm living at the moment. 
And this is um, from somewhere up in the northeast of Scotland, um, Sitka spruce, as far as you can see. And then short rotation forestry for biomass production. Um, this is popular in certain parts of the world, certainly here in France and in Italy, um, a lot of farmers plant poplar um, for very quick production, often on areas of their farms which are very wet and, and they're not uh, much use for other types of uh, crop or for, for, for cattle or sheep. Um, so maybe eight to 12 years, they will produce a crop of, of poplar trees. Um, but in other places, it might be willow or, or another species. And of, um, almost always, this is on um, agricultural land, former agricultural land. So um, what are some of the benefits of planted managed forests? Well, we can choose the species provenance, clone, whatever best suited to the conditions and the future climates and markets, rather than relying on a, nat a natural forest where we might not be able to do that. And we can plant mixtures of desired species. Um, and we can benefit from breeding programs. <clears throat> so we can use the latest um, <clears throat> material from breeding programs to increase productivity or disease resistance or drought resistance. So for example, there's a big concern with drought resistance at the moment, um, both, both in the UK and here in France. And uh, the breeders are, are working hard to, to produce um, new, um, new trees with increased resistance to drought. And uh, compared to say, um, uh, close to nature forest or it can be more organized for us that allows for easier access, thinning, harvesting, and observation. And uh, if we're using material, uh, material that's got increased productivity, we can we have faster rotations, which would allow changes as conditions change, as the climate changes. And higher productivity to meet this increased demand, we get more from less land. But some of the problems and pitfalls is that we can focus on a very few desirable species, provenances or families and clones. And there's a tendency to focus on, on whatever produces the most without taking account of potential risks of that particular clone or provenance or species. And potentially it can be difficult to switch to satisfy new market demands if too much focus on, is on a specific species. So if we put all our eggs in the Norway spruce basket as they have in Germany, now what do we do? Um, we have nothing to replace it. Um, there can be a potential reduction in biodiversity value if you're not careful how you manage these forests. And care is required during harvesting to protect soil and soil carbon. Um, and they usually require high input, money, time, fertilizer, machinery, et cetera. It's not necessarily the case, but it can be. And it might be more at risk from pests specific to preferred species. So if you've gone for one or two species, then there could be risks from particular uh, pests, as we've seen in Germany with their Norway spruce. And they are possibly less resilient than natural or managed natural forests. Okay, so, so um, this is just a little summary before I get into the, the benefits of um, CCF or, or irregular forests in terms of, of um, hazards. Demands on forests for wood products and services continue to increase, and they're going to they're going to continue to increase. Um, and there's increasing pressure on land use from urbanization and agriculture means that the forestry-based sector must make more targeted and efficient use of the land it has available. So real pressure on the forestry sector. But unfortunately, damage to forest everywhere is increasing alarmingly, I would say. And damage types are changing in the changing climate. So what we were worried about 10 years ago it's probably not what we need to be worrying about at the moment. And you can see that already 
with the switch to concerns about drought in many parts of Europe. Um, and the location of locations of damage are also changing. And there are strong interactions between different hazards. So we cannot only think in terms of one particular hazard, we have to think of, of all potential hazards. But the good news, planted managed forests offer a possibility to address some of the issues facing the forestry sector and the knowledge and tools for implementing systems to increase the productivity of, of our forests and to best make best use of the material they produce are already available. We know what to do. Um, there's a huge amount of knowledge in the sector, absolutely enormous amount of knowledge. And we know about the risks to our forests and we have tools to help assess and forecast that risk. Okay, so the requirements. Silver culture needs to be dynamic and flexible to incorporate changes and to adapt to the problems of the future. And silver cultural systems need to be resilient and to incorporate risk management mitigation strategies with the changing climate. And we need a much greater level of integration of forestry wood chain and, and proper exchange of information between all stages of the process. So, we need to know what's going on in our forests and we need to know what's coming out of our forests and this this is going to require much greater monitoring of our forests and knowledge about what they're going to provide in in terms of outputs um, whether it's timber or whether it's biodiversity or or whatever it is we're going to need to monitor our forests much more closely and the tools are there to do that. We have, we have satellite um, systems that are unprecedented um, resolution. We have drones, we have uh, ground-based LIDAR. There's all the tools for doing that. Um, and it but it requires investment, cooperation of all stakeholders from growers to processors and researchers and hard decisions on the management focus for every forest. So we need to work together and we need to share knowledge and we need to share knowledge, uh, particularly across Europe, um, because the problems that you're gonna have in the UK are already happening in further south in Europe and exchanging knowledge and information uh, and techniques is going to be important. So coming back to those five forest types, it's a pity Bill's not here because he was responsible for sort of simplifying the multitude of systems that we can, we can imagine. Certainly natural forests are going to remain those that we have. We're going to try and protect as much as possible in Europe. And mixed forests, continuous cover forestry clearly has a role. And I think short rotation Forests have a role um, because of uh, they're quite uh, quite unique. They grow on former agricultural land. They produce um, wood biomass very quickly. The question is: Is close to nature a good system and useful? And uh, I said I was going to be slightly uh, controversial. Hopefully, get some debate. And what's the future for extensive even age forests? Do they have a role? in our future management of the forest landscape. Okay, so one of the things that's been happening across Europe and, uh, and uh, in the UK as well has been um, a movement to move from uh, even age regular forests to more uneven aged irregular forests because of, of uh, the potential benefits of such systems. And when you look at the literature, there does seem to be clear evidence that tree diversity in forest stands um, enhances resistance to natural disturbances. Um, most disturbances, not all. I have to be careful because, for example, fire, if you have a mixed, a stand with mixed ages and mixed heights, you're going to have a big understory and fire. Um, will easily spread into the crown with such a system. So we have to be careful. Um, so these are a couple of recent papers. And I'll just show you an example from another paper um, where 
these colleagues in, in Germany looked at um, Norway spruce resistance against natural hazards. And on the right, uh, this is age and this is survival probability. Uh, the solid line is pure, pure um, Norway spruce. And then the dash line is uh, mixed stand with other species, but not very mixed. But this one over here is, is, um, is a, um, a spruce stands with a, a bigger mixture of other species, generally beech. And you can see that the survival is higher. Unfortunately, most of the stands in Norway are more in this area here. And that's why we've seen probably um, so much devastation in Germany in the last few years. And it would, it appears from what I've heard that stands with um, a um, mixture of species have done better than the pure stands in terms of um, bark beetle attacks in the last few years. Um, and in terms of wind, um, there's papers from Germany again and Switzerland. So here, um, mixed stands had higher growth performance than pure stands. They had a lower risk of wind damage and a lower risk of damage from um, other hazards and pests. And the vulnerability of spruce and beech forests, um, the pure um, spruce forest had a higher level of um, risk than a pure beech forest, but even and mixing beech in reduced the level of risk. And this is um, from Switzerland, this study is from Switzerland. And here's a bunch of papers um, that showed that in all cases when beech was mixed in with Norway spruce, there was a positive benefit in terms of resistance against, against wind throw. So mixed species stands appear to be um, less at risk from wind, wind damage. The, the, this is a paper after the um, 2005 Gudrun storm in South Sweden. And uh, what they looked at was the proportion of spruce from zero to 100% and the probability of damage. These are a different, um, different uh, heights of trees. But you see that as, it, as the stand goes to more towards purer spruce, this is where the other trees are deciduous, the risk of damage goes up. So having deciduous trees within the Norway spruce stand, stands seemed to make a big impact on the probability of damage during that storm. And the same was true uh, if, there was, if it was Scots pine and Norway spruce. Interestingly, although the difference is, I, I just go back up, you can see it's much more uh, clear with the deciduous species, but even having Scots pine in, improved the, the performance. Okay, so quite a long time ago, we did some wind tunnel experiments and then some field experiments to look at what was the benefit of uh, a mixed stand, certainly a mixed size stand. And this is a wind tunnel at Oxford University. Here's some model trees. They behave like trees in the wind tunnel, even if they don't look like trees. And what I want to focus on is some experiments we did with this size of tree here, which is 20 centimeters, and this size of tree, which was 10 centimeters. Um, and I want to look at two patterns we looked at, uniform, um, all the trees were 200 millimeters, and then group selection, um, where we had uh, 200 millimeter trees interspersed with 100 millimeter trees. Okay, so I don't have a nice picture of it, but if you can imagine, and what we did was we took these 200 millimeter trees and we looked at what the wind loading was when we removed half of the 200 millimeter trees. And then we looked at the wind loading when we substituted uh, the removed 200 millimeter trees with 100 millimeter trees. And look at the graph over here. So this is the extreme wind loading on trees. And this one is just purely uh, 200, this, this one here, 50% thinning of a 200 millimeter forest. So half the 200 millimeter trees in the wind tunnel were removed. And 
the number doesn't matter exactly, but I want you to compare it with here, where um, we're looking at the wind loading on the 200 millimeter trees that had neighbors of 100 millimeter tall trees. So I'll just go back up to the picture of the trees for you. So um, this guy, these guys with neighbors that tall. And what you see is there's a reduction in the wind loading. So there's some benefits of having those neighbors. And the ratio is about 0.788. Okay, remember that number in your head. Um, because what we then did was we went to Kylo Wood in, uh, in Northumberland, um, just next to the, just south of Berwick upon Tweed. It's a European larch stand. Um, at this time, it was almost 60 years old. And what had happened 11 years before is that they had put an area, in one area, they'd put pigs into the forest. And the pigs had eaten everything um, in one area of the forest. So there was some pure larch with no understory. I'll show you some better pictures in a minute. And then everywhere else, there had been regeneration of Sitka spruce. Okay. So just to let you know, Barry, that that's you just past the 30 minute point. Okay. We're getting close to the end. Um, so here's a nicer picture. You can see the guys. This was Axel um, Wellcock, my PhD student, and the guys chewing the fat in the area where the pigs have been, and next to it is where. The regeneration, the no, no pigs have been allowed, and re regeneration of Sitka spruce had occurred. We can see quite thick Sitka spruce underneath the larch. And here's the kind of instruments we put on the tree to measure the wind loading. And you can see we had a mast, as, oops, sorry, had a mast to measure wind speed. So here's, um, it's basically a strain gauge that measures the movement of the tree and we could calibrate it to tell us what the bending moment on the tree was due to the wind. And then we had a tower with anemometers on it, which allowed us to get the wind speed at canopy top. Okay, a quite complicated graph, but first over here are two large trees, which were outside in, were in the part where there was no understory. And then there were four larch trees which were in the parts of the forest which had the Sitka spruce understory. And you can see the Sitka spruce is about half the height of the larch. So very similar to the wind tunnel experiment. We've got an overstory of one height and then an understory about half the height of the overstory. And here on the right, are, are graphs of the wind loading on each of those trees on the left against wind speed. And you can see it goes about as the square of the wind speed. And what I want you to think about is this red line. And what Axel did is he calculated what the slope of that line was when he looked at the wind loading as a function of the wind speed squared. Okay. And here are the values for those trees with no understory. And then these are the values of that slope with an understory. So what you can see is that the values of the slope are lower for the trees with an understory. So that the wind loading for a given wind speed is lower for the trees with an understory compared to the trees without an understory. Now, what I did is, because this tree 101 is very tall, I just ignored it for this little exercise. I just looked at this tree 102 as representative of the wind loading um, in the part of the forest with no understory, and I compared it to the wind loading of the trees with an understory. And I hope you can all see that. The ratio is 0.783. Now, it's only one, experiment, there's only one tree without an understory, but the number is remarkably similar to what we got in the wind tunnel. So essentially more than 20% reduction in wind loading by having an understory.
Okay, so some summary and discussion. Demands for, from forests are continually increasing. Um, risks and damage levels to forests are also increasing. So business as usual no longer exists. Um, we, we have to think about how we manage our forests and how we manage our forest landscapes to deal with these demands and these threats. And managing our, as I say, managing our forest landscape as we have in the past, I don't think is, it, I, I don't think it's any longer an option. And, and that's going to be a hard lesson for many people. I know that here in the Southwest of France, it's very difficult to persuade people that we cannot keep going with uniform maritime plantations, basically touching each other all the way from Bordeaux to Bayonne. Um, it, the risk is very high of a pest or disease spreading through that landscape and also a fire spreading through that landscape as we saw this summer. And um, we have to rethink how we, we manage this landscape. And the same is true in other parts of Europe. Mixed age and mixed species forests appear to provide resistance to a number of hazards. Okay, it's very difficult to be absolutely definitive about this because the definitive experiments have not been done, but the weight of evidence is that they do provide benefits to most hazards. But as I say, not to all hazards. You really don't want an understory if you've got a very high fire risk. So if you're in Catalonia, in Spain, um, a, an understory is the last thing you want because if a fire starts, it will get into the understory and jump into the into the canopy of the overstory trees, and and then you will be facing a real problem to stop that fire. And managing our forest landscape with a diversity of forest structures and other land uses appears to be the major challenge for the future. So forests have got to be managed in conjunction with other land uses. Um, that could be agriculture, it could be in this part of the world where I live, it's now more and more solar farms, uh, but it can also be the urban environment where, um, which is encroaching into the forest. And uh, how we manage that to, to get the most from our forests without putting them at increasing levels of risk is going to be a major challenge. So thank you very much. Um, thank you for putting up with me for what, how long, about 40 minutes. And I really look forward to questions um, from you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, stop the share, okay, thank you. Thank you, Barry. Um, so I'm just gonna ask, is Liam Healy on the webinar this evening? He sent an email in to us earlier on today and it might just be worth um, discussing yeah. his question with our audience. Are you, would you like to come off mute Liam if you're here? Okay, so I'm going to assume that Liam's not with us. Um, yes, he's, he's here. He hasn't got a mic. I can, no I, mic. Can, I, I think I can remember what he wanted to know is He's um, replanting some stands and um, he's been told by, I guess it's Forestry and Land Scotland that he's got to beat up any um, trees that die. And his argument is that having a more sort of natural structure is likely to be more wind resistant. I hope I haven't, I haven't uh, got your question completely wrong. And, and my answer to, to that was, I don't know whether it's going to be better in terms of wind resistance to beat up um, the with, with new trees or whether just to leave the, the stand to develop itself. But I think having a mixed species, mixed age stand will have a benefit either way, um, if, if that's a good enough, good enough answer. Thank you, Barry. Um, Lara, who is on the call this evening, did you want to come off mute and ask your question? 
Yes, yeah, so I'm working on my management plan and I hear two very different philosophies of encouraging regeneration and letting nature have its course and using local trees or bringing in species that will be more resilient to heat, drought, etc. So I wonder, Barry, what would be your position about bringing species that are not native if they are more resilient to what we think conditions will be in 60 years? Yeah, good question. And I think there's, personally, I think there's a mistaken belief that if we go with what's natural native to an area, that's going to solve our problems. And what my point was in this talk was that that world doesn't exist anymore. The world that we've been living in for the last however many thousand years just doesn't exist anymore. So we have to be pragmatic. We have to work knowing that everything's changing in terms of the climate. And if we, we have to look at what is best going to survive uh, into the future. Now, of course, you have to be very careful in what you plan. You don't want to bring in something that's going to then cause problems because it starts to regenerate and move into other people's um, forests and so on. But there's no point planting something that's native and works okay now if in 20 years it dies because of drought. So my advice, and now I'm not, a, I'm not making these decisions, I'm just a research scientist, but my advice is look towards the future, look to what the, the hazards and threats are to your forest and think about what is most likely to survive there in the future. I mean, we've, um, we've got this big network called Reinforce that goes from Scotland down to Portugal and uh, forest research manager in the UK. And the same species and same provenances have been planted in all these arboreta from Scotland down to, to Portugal. And the idea is that people can look further south to see what is surviving in the climate that they are going to be subjected to in the future. So using that network can help people decide, well, maybe I need to look at that provenance of whatever species it is that I'm thinking of planting because it seems to be doing better in a more southerly latitude with a more extreme climate. So Thank you. I'll, I'll I, look I, them up because I feel jittery about putting, say, fig trees in England and at the same time they might do well 50 years from now. Yeah, I don't I don't envy you your job of <laughs> of trying to make decisions and to look into the future. It's 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 very tough. And that's why I guess we have to we have to spread our risks and we have to um we have to uh pr produce a forest which which, which is more resilient because we've got different options and not put it, all our eggs in one basket. Thanks, Lara, for your question. Uh, there, was a, there was a point there, somebody said that there's a reinforced uh, site at Glen Tress for people in South Scotland if they want to visit it. Uh, Barry, uh, Michael Bruce, Firebrick Services. Um, question for you about risk warnings. We've yes. just experienced three storms yes. in North and East Scotland, yes. and not one. So as you may know, I issue the fire danger warnings for Scotland, and I looked at what, was, what came out or didn't come out in terms of warnings for, for wind blow risk. Yes. And my question is, you, if you look at fire danger maps, you're given an impression and an interpretation of what likely wind blow is going, or sorry, what likely fire is, yeah. is going to be. Are there equivalent maps and systems for wind blow? No, but there should be, because we have, we have the, the, the technology to do it. We have, um, we have models that predict the risk of wind damage at different wind, uh, at wind speeds. We know what the wind speeds are gonna be in the next storm. So we can produce those maps. It's just a question of joining up um, the two bits. And I know colleagues at Forest Research at the Northern Research Station have been in talks with the Met Office people in Scotland to do exactly that. So it's, it's planned, but if people like you 
um, put pressure on on people to say we need that, then then it would happen more more quickly. I would I would guess. I, I don't want to put my colleagues in forest research into a difficult position, but it's completely possible to do that. And are you um, allowed to say who yes, is leading no. that group? Bruce Nichol is the lead. Nearly finished, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Barry. But I can't remember the name of the lady in the Met office who's working with them, but apparently it's that relationship's going really well. So I, I think there's a potential for that to happen relatively soon. Great. Thank you. Adam, would you like to come in now? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. Thanks for a really uh, wide ranging but um, worrying talk, Barry. Um, <laughs> My, my question is about uh, adaptive capacity in the forestry sector. Um, do you think the sector can move quickly enough to adapt to these synergizing changes given the slow pace of change within forestry? And how do yeah. you think we can better embed resilience and adaptability in what we do? Yeah, I think so. I mean, all my experience in the forestry sector can do anything it wants to do if it puts its mind to it. And, uh, you know, uh, it's a sector that what, I can't remember what, how many percent increase in forest cover in the UK has taken place over the last few decades. So it's just, I think a lot of it's political will. I think a lot of it has to be political will. So politicians, ministers have to basically say, we've got to change. Um, we can't just stay as we are. And um, I, um, it's not my job to do that. But I think researchers and people, like-minded people, need to put pressure on politicians to tell them we've got to change the way we do things. Um, but it can happen. It, I know it can happen because it has happened in the past. But you're in you're in Wales, I guess. But yeah, yeah. So I mean, uh, in Wales, there's been that. It's been much more of a mantra than in other parts of the UK. It, it has, yeah. I think on paper and in discussion, and I don't know how quickly it's sort of trickling into actual practice. And, and I guess we're still getting a lot of um, uh, single species plantations being restocked. Um, so I'm just, I'm just thinking we can't wait for the impact of extreme events like bark beetle, like the pictures you showed us. Yeah. And we yeah. kind of preemptively change. Um, I, I mean, I think there is a place for single species stands. Yeah. But but I don't think. We've over it's overemphasized at the moment. And quite honestly, I if you'd asked me this question maybe a year ago, I would not have been so, what's the word, so passionate about changing. But because I've been working in Germany and I've seen what's going on in Germany, it's really, really frightened me. Um, when you see places that you knew as green, full of Norway spruce, and they're all dead. It's really frightening. It's happened in three years. It's just gone. Um, it could happen in the UK. And so we, we, need seen to, it. we need to show some of those pictures to the to the Senate in, in Cardiff and uh, to Westminster. Yeah. Well, you're, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to send you my presentation. But I mean, yeah, those pictures are really, really frightening. And the numbers are frightening. You know, it's more than Storm Lothar in 1999 from bark beetles in three years. Mm. And it's carrying on. It's not stopping. So yeah, let's let's get to work. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Okay, Adam. Thanks. Uh, Sandy, would you like to come off mute and ask your question? Hi. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Um, I was interested in your slides where you had um, Norway spruce and pure stands and in a mixture. Yes. And the graphs that showed the increased uh, resilience to wind. The first one you showed, you had two uh, mixtures. One was um, had not very high species diversity, and the other one had higher species diversity. And there was quite a big difference. The one that didn't have very high species diversity was very similar to the pure stand. So I was wondering if you, if there was a minimum percentage of other species that you would need to have? Ah, uh, yeah, good yeah. question. I'm, I'm not sure I know the answer, but um, I think something like 20% of other species seems to be a, a minimum, something like that. But as I said, 
you know, the evidence is patchy and it's often difficult to compare because the data is coming from different places. So it is very difficult to give hard numbers on these things. But um, I think there was one with, with from uh, Sweden which showed, you know, uh, the more, the more, the bigger the mixture, the better in terms of reducing the wind damage in Norway spruce. Um, but again, you've got to balance that against your other objectives. If you're trying to produce timber and you've got, uh, um, I think it's oak is typical in that Norway spruce in Sweden or beech in, in Germany, then, then you know, if, if you wanted to produce a certain amount of timber, then you're probably um, going to reduce your output of, of timber from your spruce if you're mixing with with other species, so it's a sort of balancing act. Um, I, I'm sorry, that's a really waffly answer to your question. I don't have any hard and fast rules. I can go back to that literature and look at it for you if you want. And uh, if you pop your email on the chat, I'll, I'll try and get back to you on Adam. Is it Adam Curry? Good, is that? Is uh, Adam? Sandy Davidson. Oh, Sandy, sorry. Um, Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Sean, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, I uh, hope you can hear me okay. Um, yes. Great, thank you, Barry. I really, really and well, I can't say I enjoyed your <laughs> scary talk, <laughs> but anyway. Um, I'm, I'm over here in the west of Ireland, and my question is about rain. Um, so on the continent, I think uh, the trees have become a lot stressed uh, due to the, if you like, the dryness followed by, uh, you know, intense rainfall. We don't tend to have the drought that they have on the continent, but we do have the rainfall. We do have these very heavy periods of rainfall, even floods, um, and particularly in the west of Ireland where I am. And I haven't seen anything written about the impact on the soil when you have a monoculture and you also have then this uh, extreme wind coming with yeah, sometimes yeah. with the rain. It, has there been any research done on that? And I'd be very interested in if there's an impact on mixture. Should, should we be considering, if you like, um, uh, mixtures of, of, of trees that can tolerate uh, very heavy soils and very, very wet soils as well as the others? Yes, pity Bill's not here because he has looked quite a lot at mixtures, you know, on, on these wet soils. There has been some work on the impact of rainfall on stability of trees. Basically, um, it doesn't have much impact until you totally saturate the soil. Once the soil's totally saturated, then there is a sharp reduction in the rooting resistance. Um, so I guess if you've got drains and they're working well, you might be okay. But if, if the soil's allowed to become totally saturated, then there's a marked reduction in the resistance to, to the wind. Um, but initially, um, it seems like the reduced strength of the soil because of the increased wetness is balanced more or less by the increased weight of the soil because of the, of, of the moisture. But at a certain point, when it becomes fully saturated, the soil strength disappears completely, and then the trees are incredibly vulnerable. I think you, you might have seen that picture that I um, I showed from this part of the world, the Storm Lotha, at, um, where all the maritime pine were flattened. It was very wet. I don't know if you noticed the soil was very wet. Um, so yes, there is some, I'm happy to send you the literature if you you let me have your email address. I don't know how yes. best that, that is to do yeah. it. I, well, I it's really, uh, sorry, just to come back to you. It's really when the soil is saturated like that. Okay. I, I certainly have experience of it that I know the trees, it's sick and spruce, and they've come, they become extremely vulnerable uh, when the soil is totally saturated. And it, in fact, it's very difficult to drain yes. the soil you know, it's a peaty soil. Um, so I, I, yes. I, my thinking was that if I had 
for example, alder, an alder mix or something that can tolerate that kind of degree, would, would it in fact in any way alleviate the, 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 the stress on, on spruce, uh, you know? Um, I'm, I'm reluctant to give an answer, but I would suspect so. I wish Bill was here to help me. Okay. Um, you're probably better to ask Bill, but I would suspect it would. Um, basic because the older will help to to remove to pump the water i mean um and to hopefully dry the site to, to a certain extent and and help the okay. spruce deep uh roots deepen i mean uh but again i don't bill might know of that kind of mixture i don't know of, of um if there been any experiments with that kind of mixture um Sorry, I can't help more, Sean. No, that's great. Thank you. And I put um, my email address in. Yeah, I see it. If I uh, maybe can get Bill to to get back to you, planet, plan. Okay, Thanks, Steve. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Okay, we're just past five o'clock now, but we do have a couple more questions which we can hopefully get to. Um, so I've got one from Toby. Toby, would you like to come off mute? Hi, bye. Um, uh, yeah, really good presentation. Um, I was fascinated by the um, uh, the wind tunnel studies and the use of different tree sizes. And um, I, I sort of learned years ago. Um, uh, and uh, I think that the concept that I was I had learned was that the smoother the canopy surface, the, the less turbulence there was. So if you had an even age canopy, you got less turbulence. Yes, and, and there's, that is true to some extent. So one of the issues when you thin a stand is that you can actually roughen the surface and the wind loading goes up. Um, it depends, um, well, there's, there's multiple things, but one is how the trees have acclimated to their environment. So one of the benefits of having a more mixed stand is that the overstory trees are are protected to some extent by the, the smaller trees, but they acclimate to their wind environment. So trees are they're not passive, they're, they, they adjust all the time. They, they will reallocate um, biomass to wherever the tree senses it's required, either into the stem or into the roots. And the problem is always when you make a sudden change. So if you go in to a even age stand and thin it, um, then the trees are suddenly um, subjected to a wind, a wind um, climate that they haven't experienced before. And then they've got to take some time to reacclimate to that wind climate. And during that period of what is probably five or more years, they, they're more vulnerable to wind. Um, yes, these things are not always totally straightforward. And, for example, pine, generally, when you thin pine, you actually reduce the, um, the, the, the roughness of the surface because it's quite an open stand already. And um, it's, all, it's already quite rough. And when you thin it out, there's less trees and it becomes less rough. But it's not always straightforward. But I think the main benefit of CCF is that you never suddenly exposing trees to a really changed uh, wind climate and they acclimate to, to it as they grow. I, I don't know if that helps answer your question. Yeah, so, so it's a kind of gradual process in getting yes. to yes. The, the different structures. Yeah. Yes, okay. I mean, the um, I don't know if people here know Berkeley Wood that used to be in Kielder. It was a Sitka spruce Scots pine mixture and it it lasted for a very long time until it blew down. <clears throat> Basically, it was a self-thinning mixture so that the it wasn't like the Scots pine died out and the, um, the spruce stood up because it had slowly, it had slowly been um, exposed to an increasing wind loading rather than a sudden increase as it would be if we went in and, and mechanically took out the trees. Yep. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, I have um, JP. I don't know what your name is. I'm sorry. It's a question on thinning. 
Would you like to come off mute? Is this the question about, are we suggesting single tree group? group? Oh, uh, is it Julie? Is that you? It says JP for hay. Do you think thinning a 10 acre Sitka block in an exposed area at year 18, top height, nine meters under CCF, a good idea? I have concerns of wind blow. What height would you suggest is best in an early thin site? Oh Apologies gosh. I didn't do that question justice. No, it's it's fine. I mean, the best thing is if you could send me the data on your stand, I can run some simulations and have a have a look at uh, what the impact would be, um, rather than making a guess off the top of my head. So we have I didn't put it in the presentation. We have a, a wind risk model that will work at stand level or single tree level. And if I got information about the stand, I could put it through the model and look at what would be the impact of, of doing a thinning. Um, if, if you would like me to do that. So I'm gonna suggest, um, because there's quite a lot of people in the chat that have said they would like copies of presentations, if you would like anything sent out to you or you have further questions, Maybe you could email into administrator at ccfg.org.uk and I can pass those on. Um, I can see that um, Phil Morgan has his hand up. Would you like to come in, Phil? Hello, Barry. Hi, Phil. Hi there. Um, thanks for, for the presentation. It's been really fantastic. It's been, uh, it's, uh, you know, some of the things I think uh, are really important. Business as usual no longer exists. I thought that was really important and we cannot continue to manage our forests in the way we have. Um, but um, I think, you know, we do need to find new ways to do it and we need to communicate that message. And I think what you showed us there was um, it works. And if we can communicate that, I think it will be really, really important. But just picking up on the, the last question about modeling, um, there is a, a, a system uh, or a sort of a thinning pattern and um, known as graduated density that we've used in Wales and in Ireland as well. Um, and um, is that something that you would be happy to model? Um, yeah. Because, um, you know, a fascinating, um, you know, the, the, the demonstration that stand structure, the different sizes of the trees and the point you're making that these trees are adapting to their wind conditions and therefore they have individual tree stability rather than stand stability. And graduated density allows you to make that transition from stand stability to individual tree stability by phasing the removal of the trees in a particular way. Yeah. Is that something you'd be happy to model? I'd be really yeah, happy yeah, to. Yeah, would be. And you know, one thing with our model is that any what's good is to test it under different situations, and particularly where you know that something works. Mm. And then if the model doesn't reproduce that, we know we've got a problem in the model. So really pleased to try different systems. Um, I'll just tell you a story that. When we modeled wind damage here in, in Aquitaine after mm -hmm. the storm in 2009, we discovered that individual tree resistance was meaningless here because the stands are, are so uniform. Once damage starts, it just propagates through the whole stand. There's not, no way it can stop. So mm -hmm. you, you could have an individual tree that was very mm -hmm. stable, but its neighbors would all be knocked down. In yes. In lockdown. Mm -hmm. So a system where you've got a more mixed kind of um, forest structure is not going to allow propagation um, to occur as easily. So yeah, anything like that I'm interested in. Okay. Yeah, I, put I, my, I, I put my email in the chat if people want to send me questions or ask for yeah. anything. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for a great talk. And I think we've got one final uh, question from Jonathan. Thanks, Michelle, and thanks, Barry. Really great presentation, really interesting. Um, I just had a question about um, changes in root structure, if there's been any data modelling on the changes of root structure. I'm a forester that tries to promote a regular silviculture, um, you know, where I visited in the Freiburg in the Black Fox 
in the Black Forest particularly, one of the arguments that you know that's been provided is about the change in root structure with wind stability in a regular stand. But I wondered if you knew there's been any um, any literature published on that so far. That's a really good question, and and I cannot think of anything. But um, I, I cannot think of any studies of differences in root structure in in uh, these kind of mixed or con con continuous cover forests. Um, I would have to ask a colleague like Bruce Nichol whether there's anything. I can't think of, of anything off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I don't know the answer. And I'm, because I'm not a root person, I can't even, I'm not going to even try and guess. But um, what, are you saying that you were told that people were telling you that there were, were benefits in the routine structure in these type of systems? Is that what the story was in the Black Forest? Yeah, you know, one of the arguments for transformation was, um, you know, the adaptability and the changes of root structure, but obviously <laughs> very difficult to visualise if there's been no studies on it. <laughs> well, there might well have been. I'm just not aware of them, and that's probably because my head is above the ground most of the time. <laughs> Okay, thank um, you. But I can I can look at that. I'm going to write it down. I think it's a really good question. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much, Barry, uh, on behalf of CCFG for doing the webinar with us this evening. And uh, thank you to everyone for all of your questions. Um, hopefully we managed to answer most of you. And obviously Barry is going to come back to those of you who had some follow-up questions or information that they wanted. So thank you to everyone. And Barry, once again, thank you very much. And we'll hopefully see everyone in November with our next webinar. Yeah, well, it's been a huge pleasure. And, and you guys, you guys go to work. <laughs> you've got you've got work to do. <laughs> got some persuading to do. Okay. Thanks, Barry. Thanks very much to everybody for coming along.